The following video I'm going to show you is one of the most important interviews I've ever done, and that is with pioneer cryptographer Whitfield Diffie. Whitfield Diffie invented the Diffie Hellman Exchange, which pretty much started this revolution with asymmetrical cryptography, which is used in cryptocurrencies today. Pretty much all cryptocurrencies use it. So that's how important this guy is. In this video, we talk about what it took to get this invention into mass adoption, into every website, and then we talk about his views on cryptocurrencies on the blockchain and finally the quantum threat that it poses to blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and the insights that this legend offers. Hey guys, I'm here with American cryptographer Whitfield Diffie. So how, how do you find this field right now? So you've been in cryptography for a long time and what do you see in this kind of blockchain well, space? I'm seeing this, I'm experiencing something for the second time. So in 1997 or so, when I went to the RSA show, suddenly it had gone from hundreds of people to thousands of people. Right. And I walked onto the show floor and there's an acre or more of stuff. And I really thought, you know, I knew this was important. I right. knew it was going to be big. I imagined you know, millions of devices chattering at each other, but I never understood how many thousand people had to be hustling to turn a buck to make it work. Right. <laughs> and this, I'm having a feeling again, all of a sudden it's exploded again. Yeah, and, and it's like this conference is just going huge and bigger yeah. and bigger. And it's, right. it requires a lot of effort. So with pushing cryptography forward as well, so what you said is you said it took a lot of effort, like a lot of people to hustle to, right. to do that. Yeah. When I started out, I didn't understand cryptography as a business. Mm -hmm. I thought about cryptography as a technology, cryptography as in some ways a political phenomenon, but I didn't think about how big a business this would have to become to achieve the the things I imagine technically. Right. right. I mean, pretty, pretty much right now, the whole internet is based on public key cryptography. You got HTTPS and... Is, is that true? Or is well, that it's an essential ingredient. I yeah. mean, the, I would say, you know, the whole internet is based on the IP protocol. Right? <laughs> That's you right. Imagine. But, but, um, but, yes, public key cryptography plays, as far as I can see, an essential role mm -hmm. in the security of internet commerce. Right, right. And how do you, how do you get introduced to the blockchain space? I mean... Um... You know, I, uh, that's a great embarrassment because about what, six, seven years ago, we, we picked the right time, it, um, John Markov the New York Times right. uh, sat down with me at my usual cafe in Palo Alto right. and he told me about Bitcoin and he gave me this uh, paper about Bitcoin and I was fascinated right. primarily with the notion of Bitcoin mining right. as an issue of, you know, you can invest money and then you can mine something valuable just the way you can invest money in prospecting and get yourself a gold <laughs> pan and things like that and go out, right? right? But for some reason, I miss the fact that I could just download uh, there was code. I could have downloaded, I could have mined Bitcoin myself. Yeah, you and could have done I, that. I didn't discover that and uh, so I, I could be retired by now. <laughs> so in terms of uh, what the projects you're working with, you're probably working with NKN right now. So what do you see there? Well, I'm working with NKN indirectly. Right, right. I'm with an outfit called Cryptic Labs. Right, right. Which does sponsored applied research in mm -hmm. cryptography. Right. You know, with an emphasis on blockchain, but not an exclusion right, on blockchain. Right. And um, one of our clients is, is NKN. So what are you doing there in that sense? Like, how, how are you helping them with the cryptography? Well, you should ask them whether I'm helping or not. <laughs> um, they have an idea about, a, a, as they call it, a new kind of network. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they've sent me all of these things, you know, Mark, do not disclose, right. that are going to be published, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. <laughs> Soon or something like that. So I'm unclear to what to say about their... Uh, okay, so we'll keep it quiet about, for now. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of, you know, one thing that's in crypto for a long time, I'm not sure if the, you're the best person to ask this, but... You know, quantum computing is developing very quickly. What's wrong, Rick? Is it the quantum carburetor or something? Everyone's so worried about the quantum threat that it poses to, say, public key cryptography. What, what's your view on that? Well, okay. Whether there's going to be quantum computing mm -hmm. is something you really need to ask a physicist. Right. And uh, they've been promising us quantum computing for, you know, heaven knows how long at this point. <laughs> and it's made in some sense, you know, if how, many, how many bits worth they can do. It hasn't, hasn't made a lot of progress. On the other hand, 
it is also clear to me that a lot of thinking has been done on the subject and there is some reason mm -hmm. that Intel, Microsoft, uh, Google was another one, IBM, yeah, I, they're all trying to build. are all trying to build quantum computers. The, the processor is a quantum computer. So I, I believe <clears throat> I believe that's going to come along. Um, and the idea of quantum computers is so short as algorithm apparently, like or, or just an algorithm that you can try to. It's an algorithm that finds hidden cycles. Right. Right. So in any transformation of of a message space, you can keep transforming the message again and again and again and again. Romamu. 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 I come to barter. <laughs> Eventually, you get back to something you've seen before, right? Right, and but it might be hard to find out how long it is before that happens. That, that's what's at the heart of Diffie-Hellman and RSA mm -hmm. is being able to conceal the lengths of cycles, right? Okay, and Shor's algorithm finds hidden cycles, right? So it represents a significant threat to the current public key crypto systems, and there are two possibilities, right? And I one is that that's sort of a limited threat because those exponential things can be scaled quite a distance. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. So Daniel Bernstein has for his amusement a billion bit RSA modules. Okay. Right? I don't think that's really a very practical <laughs> object, right? Thing, but the point is we're using, you know, two, three thousand bits at the moment. We could scale to ten thousand bits or something. Can we have finite you know, cycles there, right? That's well, I mean, that's well, that's what I don't know. That is say it depends on exactly how far the quantum computers can be scaled. Right. But well, well, right now we don't have a practical. Order. Well, right now we don't have a practical. Way. They keep announcing they factored the number fifteen, right? <laughs> Faster than anybody ever factored the number fifteen before, right? I mean, there may be some slightly. I remember some talk about fifty or fifty-one qubits or something. But right. but the point is that it is anywhere right at this moment. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing that I know about is anywhere close to what's needed. No, no. But that it could come on fairly sudden. Now, there are other techniques known that are not as vulnerable to quantum computing. Mm -hmm. However, they're also, to speak, larger and slower. Right. So my interest in that direction is in part that you might find yourself with the need to cash keys, to do a key negotiation, and then keep the key around for somewhat longer. Right. And that, so I imagine a world in which maybe, you know, on January 1st or 2nd business day, you, you call up Amazon and you have a one minute long call in which you negotiate <laughs> your key for the year. Right. right. And then you cash that key. And then you future. cash that and you hold on to that key. Okay. Right. Now, I don't, just don't know whether that's what's coming, but that's one of the inconvenient things one can easily imagine. It's kind of scary because there's always a threat that's going to come, but then you never you never see them deliver. That's the biggest problem. Like it's like well, all right, but sure, but that's you know if a quantum quantum computing comes through, it's going to deliver a lot more than an impact on cryptography. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's all sorts of engineering problems that will be amenable to this vast impact, mm -hmm. and it might be sufficient that nobody must care what happened to cryptography. <laughs> I mean, you know, it might be. While walking around the ceiling instead, you know? But... <laughs> Maybe. So I have one last question. I think um, it always amuses me how kind of genius public key cryptography is. How, would you, how did you come up with the idea? You know, like, what, what sparked you into that? Well, um, naturally, I get asked this a certain number of times. <laughs> Roughly speaking, you know, like all mathematicians who got into cryptography, Mm -hmm. Right, essentially, I have, I want to clean the subject up. Nobody knows for sure whether crypto systems are secure. This just needs a sound mathematical basis. When I have systems, we're going to prove they're secure. Well, I couldn't solve that problem, right? So I was sitting around. I couldn't solve that problem. I worked on other things, you know. Right. right. And, and um, one thing I was trying, what I was trying to do, was to combine what's called a identification friend or foe, mm -hmm. which a fire control radar. Uh, challenges an aircraft and says, you know, do you know how to encrypt my message and send it back to me? And I'll tell the I'll tell the gun to refrain from shooting at you. Right. And one-way ciphers, as used in password tables, mm -hmm. which protect you. In you know, the first thing, the IFF in in more domestic terms protects you against shoulder surfing. If you type the same password all the time, somebody can watch and see you type the right. password. What IFF amounts to is the password changes all the time. Mm -hmm. And it, it sends you a challenge and you send back a reply that is... Uh, okay, that has a different reply every time. Every time, every right. time. 
And so the but the uh, but there's another an, an wholly another problem, which is what's represented by passwords, that it's really in, really convenient not to have the password table be secret. Mm-hmm. So you transform the password into into something that's different. Okay, so the password tables, even you put those two things together and you have digital signature. Ah. Okay? And I, I realized that, you know, just because you could recognize the right solution to a problem didn't mean you could solve it. Right. And so the signer is able to solve a problem the verifier can't solve. Right, right. And a week or so later, I realized that, my God, I've been thinking for a long time about how to negotiate keys I mean, between people right. who are not, and this could be turned around. Right. To do that. So And that's it's interesting. Did, did you ever see that it would be used for something like blockchain or Bitcoin or something like that? Well of like, course I didn't see that it'd be used for blockchain. <laughs> well, obviously, or right? Or else you would have made I mean, it. <laughs> I, it's interesting to me. I was never terribly motivated by the direct sort of money applications. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I kind of thought more in terms of secure mail, secure phones, right, right. secure communications. Um, and I certainly thought in terms of of signatures, I was imagining. I started this in 1970. I imagined a paperless office, and I couldn't figure out for quite, for five years what you would do about signatures, right? So this is, you know, I was thinking more in terms of interoffice memos and letters and things of that kind. So the person who thought forever about financial applications, a man named David Chow, he had a company called DigiCash, and a whole lot. But they never succeeded in making it catch on mm. the way it's caught on now. Right. And so that's, uh, I think, the the issue is how to make it decentralized. And it seems to me the blockchain has been the first big contribution to that. Yeah, and it's it's so interesting how the ecosystem is developing because now they're talking about community building, using tokens to build a community, and it's it's, it's such a different application, I guess, yeah. from 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 the original outset. So so in terms of dreamers and how do you see the space, do you feel like we're pushing it in the right direction? Do you think like there's too much being hyped up here or do you feel like it's it's just the right amount? Well, you know, I can't bring myself to quite the enthusiasm I expressed to, uh, I was later CEO of uh, Google. Um, or is it Eric Schmidt? Eric Schmidt. Eric Schmidt. Eric Schmidt. Eric. He, was, uh, I, he was talking at some event and whether, whether asking, asking whether the internet was, asking rhetorically, is the internet overhyped? And I opened screaming, under hype, under hype. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think, you know, I think nobody can imagine the impact of communications mm-hmm. on human society. Right. We've seen 1% of it, a tenth of a percent of it or something. How individual things like, you know, public key or blockchain or something else will play into that, I don't know. But uh, there's certainly a lot of room for, for action. Awesome, and I hope you enjoyed the conference and I hope Thank you have you. a great talk today. Good. Cheers. Thank you much. Thank you.